Hey, welcome to Overtime, where we take Sunday's message further. My name is Jeremy, and I'm your host. And this is a podcast where we just want to ask the questions that we think that you would ask as it relates to Sunday's message. And as we do so, we hope that it helps you grow in your life and your faith. With that being said, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all of the podcasts that are coming out. Not only that, hit the like button, because when you do so, it helps us help other people. And if you ever have a question about Sunday's content or about Overtime, you can submit those to overtime at npaustin.com, and we will be sure to get to those in future podcasts. So with that being said, here's a quick recap of Sunday, and then we're going to jump into our conversation today. Now, throughout the series, the question that we have been asking and answering is why did Jesus come into the world? So what did the people in the first century, who did they think Jesus was? Thought he was a great prophet who had appeared among us, they said. And perhaps Jesus smiled and he said, guys, I have come for something so much more. Jesus, are you saying that you're gonna do away with all this temple and priest and the sacred text and traditions? Don't think that I've come to abolish the law. I've come come into the world to fulfill it. Until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of the pen will by any means disappear until everything is accomplished. Jesus punctuates this. I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. Why did Jesus come into the world? To be born under God's covenant with Israel. And I came into the world to fulfill that. I came into the world to end it. And I came into the world to replace it with something brand new. Uh, I was going to ask you, I wanted to ask you if you uh, watched the Oscars. I watched 30 minutes okay. of the Oscars. Yeah. Did you have, you have you seen the, the movie that won Best Picture, Coda, on Apple no. TV? Uh-uh. Oh, it's fantastic. Is it? It's such a good movie. Wow. Yeah, I love it. No, I haven't watched it. I, I saw that one, and there was a... Oh, Noons. Dunes. Dune. Dunes. Dune. I was thinking of the MMA <laughs> fighter, Noons. <laughs> Amanda Noons. <laughs> Dune. Yeah, I actually... I didn't watch the Oscars at all. I just... I forgot it was on. Oh, really? But... um, And you then I heard it. slap? No, I didn't see the slap, oh. but I heard about it, and now I've watched it. The slap? Uh, uh, man, it is all over yeah, the social news. media. Um, and I found... The reason I asked you a dad joke a second ago... It's because I found two really good ones. Dad jokes? I follow dad jokes on Instagram. From the Oscars? Uh, no, somebody like wrote these dad jokes as okay. from the Oscars. Uh, the first one is, there can be 100 people in a room, and 99 won't slap you, but one will. <laughs> like Will Smith, you get it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, no, here's, here's a better one. Okay. Chris Rock couldn't figure out why Will Smith was on stage walking his way, and then it hit him. <laughs> See that one got you. Yeah, that one was good. Those are our dad jokes. Yeah, <laughs> I love dad thank, jokes. Thank you, Jeremy. You're thank welcome. You. Those yep. are good. Yeah. yeah, way to go. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, let's jump in. <laughs> <laughs> let's get going. So okay. we we're in uh, part two of a series we kicked off a week ago mm-hmm. uh, called "Why Did Jesus?" and we're kind of leaving a fill in the blank because we are asking questions about why Why did Jesus do what he did? Why did he say uh, what he said? And week one, we talked about why did Jesus uh, come? Why, why did he come into the world? And Jordan unpacked that. And then we're really just taking the rest of the questions really layers after that question. I mean, that is like the foundational one. And Jesus had a lot of answers. Mm-hmm. Um, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I mean, he said so many things about why he came. We're kind of just unpacking different aspects of it. Mm-hmm. Um And the one that that you unpacked this past Sunday in part two is why did he say something greater than the temple is here? And there there was a lot to it in terms of uh, the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. And you're looking at Old Covenant, you're looking at New Covenant, Old Testament, New Testament. I mean, so much history with the temple and the nation of Israel. Um, And I I would just say if you haven't listened to part two, of the message, go back and listen to it because probably where we're going to go in the podcast today is really banking on you <laughs> listening to part two of the message. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, we'll try. We'll yeah. try if you haven't. Mm-hmm. There will still be some helpful questions, but that'll definitely right. be advantageous for anybody listening. So um, I want to dive into some questions because we got a couple uh, bigger ones that we want to unpack. Uh, the first one is this, again, talking about the Old and New Testaments. Mm-hmm. Why haven't I heard the Old and New Testaments explain in this way before? And it might be good just to say a quick 
here's what the bottom line was on Sunday so people understand what explaining in this way before was. Sure. So, you know, on Sunday I said the bottom line is Jesus was born under the Old Covenant. So he came into this world under what we call the Old Covenant slash Old Testament. And uh, he was born for a purpose, and he came in to fulfill it. Um, He came to end it, and he ultimately came to replace it with something brand new. And that brand new thing is what we call the New Covenant. And it's brand new. It's for the world. The Old Covenant was not for the world. The Old Covenant was specifically kind of in a proprietary nature just for the people of Israel. So um, when Jesus came and said, hey, something greater than the temple's here, that when everything's been fulfilled, it will disappear, meaning the Old Covenant will disappear. And I talked about that preposition that said, hey, when he said on the cross, it is finished when he died on the Roman cross, and then he rose again on the third day to punctuate what he said and what he did. It's true. Like, it's it's like the new covenant is here. It's timeless in terms of from this time forward. And so, you know, uh, it's just all about Jesus now. And so that's kind of, in summary, what I was talking about. And um, I think uh, the question, like, why haven't, you know, you heard this before? Um, You know, I think there's a lot of reasons, perhaps, you know, if you didn't grow up in church, maybe, uh, is potentially a reason. Um, You know, uh, maybe, you know, it's uh, you're a fairly new follower of Jesus. And so this is like, man, I just put my faith and confidence in Jesus. And now, like... I'm learning all these new things that could be, you know, those are very kind of uh, practical answers. Yeah. Um, And I I just want to add really quick something you said on Sunday that I think is important for the discussion. Sure. Um, The reason this is important, the reason we're looking at what Jesus said, something greater than the temple is here, is because you were arguing that a lot of people leave, Mm -hmm. uh, walk away from Christianity unnecessarily so. Yeah. Because they walk away based on what they read in the Old Testament. They walk away based on what... Uh, they the old covenant things in the old co- covenant that are confusing and need a lot of context and need to be unpacked. They're not walking away because of Jesus, right. and Jesus is is the foundation. I mean, the person of Jesus is obviously the foundation of Christianity. And so you were kind of saying, hey, mm-hmm. people didn't, don't need to walk away based on these things. Why? Because it was replaced with the new covenant. Um, which Jesus came to establish, right? Yeah, and that's a really good point. I think, you know, I would contend, and you know, that uh, the only reason not to become a Christian is because of Jesus. That's it. And the only reason to become a Christian, I think, is because of Jesus. What you say about who he yeah. was? Who is Jesus? I, you know, we've said this before. That that is the most important question. In fact, you know, I haven't gone this far, but just you know, if you're listening or watching, I would just say. You know, I, I would sell everything. I would do everything. I would go into significant debt to get to the bottom of that question. Is Jesus really, did he live in human history? And if he did live in human history, did what he have to say that he is the son of the living God, is that, or can we hold those words as valuable and as true? And I think the ultimate question is, did he rise from the dead? Because if he did, it's a game changer. And, you know, that's what Easter is all about. So, yeah. And I think, you know, if people are walking away, and I said this on Sunday, is that, you know, I listen to a lot of atheists, a lot of the new atheists. I read a lot of blogs. I read a lot of books. I listen to a lot of podcasts. I listen to a lot of debates. I mean, that's just, it's part of my world. And uh, and and I love to hear the other side, and I love to hear why people are walking away. And I would, I think it's pretty fair to say 99% of the time, maybe it's 985 but 99% of the time. Most of the time. Most of the time, yeah. I would say that the number one reason as to why I'm not a Christian or why I've walked away from faith or why I think it's archaic and not relevant is because of Old Covenant reasons mm. and Old Testament reasons. And I don't hear a lot, well, it's because of Jesus. Because when I looked at the historical accuracy of Jesus, when I looked at the historical facts of Jesus, when I looked at what Jesus said— that's why I'm not a follower of Jesus. That's why I walked away from Christianity. So I think if people are walking away unnecessarily so, then we should try to clear up the confusion. And that's, you know, Sunday, that was the attempt to do that. Yeah, for sure. And a lot of people haven't heard um, old and new. And so you talked about a couple of those reasons, but keep unpacking why we haven't heard it kind of explained in this dichotomy before. Yeah, I think, you know, maybe, maybe you know, our culture, we live in the now, the here and now. And so we want things like, hey, today, and we, we lose sight of the past. And I think losing sight of the past uh, can create a lot of havoc for us. I think it can create, like, we repeat things of the past because we haven't learned about the things of the past. Mm-hmm. And not knowing, you know, like... Um, you know, the, the context of the old and the new, not knowing about the old covenant and new covenant, not having that kind of historical timeline. I think a lot of times, you know, it's, um, and it, it just creates confusion. 
um, like we talked about on Sunday, but it's part of the reason we do that is we just want the here and now. We want, hey, what's latest and greatest? And I think it, it does do us, like at the end I said, hey, if you're a follower of Jesus, you should know this. Like this should be one of the things you go research is, is to go, I mean, the new covenant's been around for over 2,000 years. And um, the old covenant going into Jesus's time frame was around for about 2,000 years. You know, the Abrahamic covenant was about 2,000 years before Jesus. And so it's like, this is historical stuff. This is, this is stuff that, you know, these are questions that I think first century followers, first century Jesus followers who had put their trust and faith in Jesus and who were part of starting the first century church, they didn't have these kind of questions about the old and the new covenant because Jesus was right there. And when he, you know, the very first communion, when Jesus took the cup, he said, this is my blood given to you. It's a new covenant. Like, this is brand new. And they all knew this language. They all were familiar with this language. And I think historically knowing that, it brings a lot of clarity today. Just like, you know, historically knowing things of the past, the things we've done, you know, as a, as a nation that we're not proud of. Knowing why we're not proud of those or knowing what happened helps give a lot of context today and also helps us prevent from doing those things over and over and mm-hmm. over. So mm-hmm. I think that's part of it, um, you know, that um, – just knowing the history, um, if you don't know the history, then perhaps this would be the first time you've heard it. Um, but, you know, for hundreds of years, this would have been common language, common knowledge, like to go, oh, yeah, the old covenant, that's that's disappeared. That's gone away. It's new covenant. It's all, all, all about Jesus. Um, and then I think the church, I think, um, like I made the statement, I think the first century church to the uh, 21st century church, there's just this gravitational pull to do what we know. Like, this is familiar. This is, like, change is hard. Innovation is hard. Creativity is hard. This is just, it's kind of worked. And so I think when Jesus said, hey, it's brand new. I've come to introduce something brand new. Like, guys, go, like, and make disciples, make, uh, you know, of all nations. Like, I think at this point they were like, okay, now there's a lot of people following, like Peter, you know, one of the uh, one of the uh, apostles. I mean, he preaches right after the resurrection about Jesus, and you guys killed him, <laughs> but he died for you. And five thousand men put their faith and trust in Jesus, not including women and children. So now all of a sudden, you have crowds, and these crowds need places to gather, and these places to gather are called ecclesias, which is church. And now you have these churches, and now it's like, okay, what do we do? Well, you know, what did my grandma do? What did my mama teach you? What did I do in the temple? What did I do, you know? And so now they begin to bring this gravitational pull. Jesus is like, go start something brand new. But what they know knew to do was what they had always done. It was a temple model. It was a temple model. And so sacred places, sacred texts, sacred people, sacred things, sacred rituals, sacred traditions. And so many of those things I think, you know, the first century church struggle with. And we see that, I think, you know— and the letter of Acts, I mean, they're still trying to bring these old temple model things and, you know, circumcise, you know, the, the men. Yeah. <laughs> and the guys were not fans of this. And they were like, I thought this was brand new. <laughs> yeah. And that's a great example. I mean, there's a yeah. massive argument. What is it? Acts 15? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and there's a massive argument about whether whether all these Gentiles, non-Jewish people need to get circumcised now right. that they're becoming Christians. And based on what Jesus said, it's being new. The answer is no, they don't. Like, yeah. It's just faith in Jesus, and they're good to go. Yeah, and Paul made this very clear. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's faith alone. Yeah. I mean, it's where your confidence is. You know, is it in your works, in your good deeds, and are you going to be good enough to stand before the yeah. perfect justice of God, or is somebody going to come substitute, which is Jesus? But the fact that they were having the argument about, argument about circumcision right. shows this gravitational pull of us to go to what's comfortable. Exactly. So Not sin- comfortable. Right. Well, we're familiar with. Familiar. We're talking about circumcision here. So you see Not that in the first century church, and then you just fast forward to second, third, fourth, fifth, to the 21st century church, and today, like, there are there are buildings that are on par with Jesus. There are saints on par with Jesus. There is Mary, which is on par with Jesus. There are things that are done historically in the church. There are people and saints and reverends and uh, reverends and, you know, pastors that somehow get put on par with Jesus. And here we are again. You know, kind of pulling this Old Covenant, Old Testament, temple model, and we keep pulling it in. There's this gravitational pull, which creates an enormous amount of confusion. So then, as a follower of Jesus today in the 21st century church, all of a sudden I walk in and I see kind of like these Old Covenant ideas. And then I hear about this book that's been put together that, you know, I said multiple times on Sunday, hey, this didn't come until 300 years until after Jesus, called the Bible, you know, that was conveniently put together for us. 
Now this book is talking all about, you know, the old covenant, new covenant. I guess they're all one and the same. And there's examples and demonstrations of old covenant things that are very sacred that seem to compete with Jesus. So it just adds to this massive amounts of confusion. So, you know, long answer to say, I think part of it is that gravitational pull um, that has existed in the church from day one. Yeah. I also think um, there's probably to add to it, and I want to ask you to unpack this one, is... um, the Bible as a whole. Like, I think a lot of people will ask a question and the answer is, well, the Bible says to answer their question. Mm -hmm. And for somebody like me who didn't grow up in church, I mean, North Point's been my only, you know, for the most part, my only church experience. And uh, when somebody gave me that answer, my next question is, well, why does the Bible saying that make it relevant to the question I'm originally answering? Mm -hmm. And it's because there's a lack of context about the Bible and why the Bible is a source of authority. Uh, to begin with, to answer the big questions in life, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And a lot of times people just say the Bible says. They don't say, well, there's a guy named Paul, and he wrote a letter to this this group of people called the Corinthians. You know what I mean? And so uh, there seems to be a lack of understanding of how the Bible is put together Mm -hmm. and and how it all kind of meshes. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, and I think that's part of the historical piece too, just to go, the more that you understand how the Bible is canonized, put together, conveniently all 66 letters put together for us, you know, 39 of the old, 27 of the new, um, you know, once you begin to understand that, you're like, oh gosh, that gives even more context. It gives even more, you know, perspective to go, okay, you know, there is this big you know, this big moment where Jesus said it is brand new. And so I think when the Old Testament, I think the Old Testament is a very interesting discussion in terms of how these 39 letters were the ones picked. Um, There's the Apocrypha, which are outside the 39 letters. I think they're all valuable. I think they're interesting. I think uh, some traditions would include the Apocrypha, but I think, uh, you know, um, all the apostles, Jesus never referred to the Apocrypha. So it's, you know, in terms of which ones would go in the Old Testament, um, you know, there's a long process to that, but the 39 were selected. And um, and what's really cool, uh, I think the one tidbit versus going on this big historical journey with you would be, um, uh, I think it's really cool to look at the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, Dead Sea Scrolls were found in the mid-1900s, so I think like 1945, 1946, something like that. And the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is amazing, they predate Jesus. And they have things like Isaiah 53, you know, which, which talk all about the uh, prophesy, all about Jesus. Now, these are predating Jesus and giving incredible detail about the life of Jesus, about his clothes, about his bones, about all these kind of things. And you're just thinking about this going, wow, this predated Jesus. Well, we have essentially the entire Old Testament, the entire Old Covenant, all 39 of those letters that are found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which predate Jesus. And we have those in our possession today. And so, you know, that goes from oral tradition to where, you know, the authors of the Old Testament were, you know, people like Moses and people like Jeremiah and people like David and Solomon and so on. So we have all these authors, um, the 39 letters that are put together, but the Old Testament was, um, and I don't have a good example for this, but uh, you and I were talking earlier, I don't know if it would, it wouldn't fit this way, but something like the Old Testament were put together in what we call modern day uh, Bible as more of a convenience. It's more as like, oh, if it's like a dictionary. It's like, hey, if you have a question about this, because oftentimes, you know, Peter or Paul or Matthew is speaking to a specifically Jewish crowd who had an old covenant context, and they used old covenant examples because the old covenant was necessary and prophesied about the Messiah, which is the new covenant. Mm -hmm. So they would refer back to, so it's great to have that. So when, you know, in the late 300s, when they put the Bible together, the idea was to go, let's keep the old covenant, the old Testament, but the old Testament, the old covenant, the reason why we're keeping it is so you can reference back to it. Right, but it's the old covenant. It's disappeared, as Hebrews, I think, eight says. It's 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 extinguished. It's gone. Like it's it's no longer necessary because something brand new is here. But hey, if we're going to put this together for convenience' sake and for the people, let's go ahead and put it together in the Bible. Yeah. So that's where you get the old covenant. <laughs> the old testament is part of it, but then the new testament is really interesting because that's twenty seven letters that were written within just a few years of the life of Jesus, and we actually have parts of the manuscripts today that are that close to the life of Jesus that you can go look at. I don't know if you can touch. You may get arrested if you try to touch them. Probably some glass that keeps you from touching them. Yeah. yeah. But you, you can go do this, and which is amazing is you know we had these letters that were written to the churches and written to individuals that are talking about what Jesus said. And 
what Jesus did. And even Luke, you know, historically is meticulous in making sure to corroborate the stories, making sure to give detailed accounts, making sure to give times and places of who's the governor and at what place and what city to go. They wrote it as they're capturing something in human history. And then these letters were distributed to the churches. Well, as these letters are distributed to talk about the new covenant, to talk about Jesus, to talk about what he did, because now this is going throughout the world, which Jesus commanded his followers to do, you know, there there was this Gnostic movement that began to creep. And this came in the early, like, you know, I would say just in the early days of the church, in the um, that you had these Gnostic Gospels are being written, um, that salvation is no longer by Jesus in the person because Gnosticism doesn't believe as, uh, you know, um, in the material. Gnosticism would say the material is evil. It's about the spirit. Uh, Gnosticism would say salvation. They would, um, would say something opposite of what Paul said. So Paul said you know, that salvation is by faith alone, grace alone. In Ephesians chapter 2, well, Gnosticism says you must be enlightened, and your enlightenment comes from this higher knowledge, and higher knowledge comes from this emotional feeling. So this emotional knowledge, this emotional kind of quest, and if I get this higher knowledge, higher feeling, then I am now good with God. And that Jesus was crucified, not Jesus the Spirit, because the Spirit is good, the material is bad. The, the actual body of Jesus, the bad part, was the one crucified, but his Spirit wasn't actually crucified, mm. which has huge theological doctrinal implications. And this is all developing in the first century church. And now you have these two kind of corresponding narratives, and the Gnostics are starting to you know, pull names like Peter and pull names like Thomas and attach it to their letters. Well, they never spoke to Thomas. They never spoke to Peter. They never had Peter's influence. They were actually just putting their names in their letters called the Gnostic Gospels, so like the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Thomas. You know, there's all these different Gospels. They were putting the names of the apostles in their letters to give their letters some credibility. Well, what the first century followers of Jesus knew, the Orthodox ones, they were like, what are you doing? You're confusing this. And so that's where we get like the Apostles' Creed. The Apostle Creed says, hey, there's now this confusion because of the Gnostics that's coming up on what Jesus said is brand new. So we're going to synthesize this and say this is what it's all about, and here's the Apostles' Creed. And then in the early church councils, the Gnostics in these letters that the Gnostics were writing was creating all kinds of confusion. So they said, listen, let's begin to look at the letters that were written by the apostles or someone who was associated with apostles, so historically timeline. Let's begin to look at the letters that have historical context. In other words, they historically say times and places that are accurate because a lot of the Gnostic Gospels said inaccurate historical things. Let's begin to look at the letters that are divinely inspired that are calling us to a higher standard, which Jesus called us to. And, let, and these letters will, uh, were, were the letters that would eventually become canonized, and those would become the 27 letters in the New Testament. And the reason they can, canonized all of these letters and then attached the Old Testament was to clear up the confusion. To say, these are the ones that were divinely inspired. These were the ones that were written by the individuals who were Jesus' apostles or who saw the resurrected Jesus Christ. So these are the ones that are orthodoxy. And then everything else, there's a lot of other letters that are floating around. That was to clear up the confusion. And that's where we get the Bible. And knowing that not only gives us some historical context to go, okay, that's interesting where the Bible came from, but it also gives us some context to go, that the Old Testament serves its purpose and is valuable, but they wanted to capture this new covenant, this brand new thing that Jesus gave, and they were willing to give their lives. I mean, to canonize this whole process, they were willing to give their lives to do it. And so it's, it's fascinating story, but I mean, that's, that's a very hodgepodge (laughs) summary of summary, what you can probably study for years and years and years. Well, yeah. I mean, you can study it in more in depth and there's a much more kind of linear and sequential way to explain that. But yeah. No, for sure. I think, and I think it's helpful on a practical standpoint because uh, as you were talking, an example was coming to mind, but if we're talking about a certain topic and somebody says, well, the Bible says, Mm -hmm. and I'm just going to use sexual immorality as an example. It's not the best one, but you know, the Bible says flee from sexual immorality. Right. Awesome. Cool. But then you understand Paul wrote that to the Corinthian church and what was going on in Corinth at the time was it was totally normal for a, a husband to come home from his way from work and swing by the temple, sleep with a couple prostitutes and make it like it was that kind of culture, that kind of world in which Paul wrote this letter, flee from sexual immorality. 
it gives it a totally different level of weight and context to understand what that means for us today, right? right. And so that's why I just think from a practical standpoint, um, you know, for anybody who's, who, you know, who would go like, I've heard somebody say the Bible says, um, like, don't, don't take that at face value. Like, that there's probably a more meaningful context that if you do some exploration and some more questions, you can come to a much, much more helpful answer with what you're questioning. Yeah, and I do think give weight. I mean, I think the, you mm-hmm. know, I've talked about the Bible and why we can take take the Bible seriously. Um, you know, and I've made this statement before, and this may be controversial, but if you cannot take the Bible as a, a work of antiquity that is historically accurate, I do not think you can take any other work of antiquity with any any sort of credence or credibility. Mm-hmm. The Bible is just standalone. There's so many resources that talk about the manuscript evidence, the archaeological evidence, even the prophetic evidence I referred to in Isaiah 53 and the statistical probability of telling this one narrative, you know, over 66 letters, 40 different authors, you know, mm-hmm. 1600. It's just, it's amazing. There's no other work of antiquity like it. So the Bible does hold weight in itself, and especially the more you understand how it came together and was canonized. But I do think understanding the context of each individual letter and who was it written to is a really important part of the hermeneutic. Hermene- hermeneutic is the science of interpretation. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that we can interpret incorrectly yeah. because it wasn't written to that context. It was written to a group of people in Corinth. It was written from, you know, the Apostle Paul to address or, you know, or it was written from one of the early church, James, you know, church leaders to address circumcision. Mm-hmm. And so we try to apply that context to something far outside of its context. So that's important to know. Yeah. And, and just to, to piggyback off that, I mean, when you're talking historical works of antiquity, you're talking like Plato and Aristotle and these like ancient documents that, yeah. you know, in, in school growing up, we just take it at face value. Mm-hmm. We're not really told in a lot of ways, and this isn't like a us versus the system kind of thing, but we're sure. not really told like, hey, we have the amount of copies we have of those documents is in maybe in the, the single digits, maybe the double digits mm-hmm. um, for something like Plato, Aristotle, and then the copies for the original, you know, New Testament manuscripts that date really close to when they were originally written mm-hmm. is in like the tens of thousands. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just drastically different. It's on a whole yeah. other scale. Yeah, and I think to me, I'm always like, hey, let's just, let's just, you know, kind of put the, the ideas on the table, like all the ideas, and you have enough value in my eyes, and hopefully I have enough value on your eyes to decide, like, what's, to, you know, let's reason together. Mm-hmm. And whatever comes like, hey, I think we should be intellectually honest and know, like when we talk about works of antiquity, like the Bible, Mm -hmm. like what other works of antiquity are there? And why would we say, I think that actually happened in history? I think that's true. And why would we not say that of the Bible? Mm -hmm. You know, and those are really fair questions. I mean, that's getting into a separate discussion, but yeah. 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 One of the things that people have a hard time uh, reconciling is when they think about the new covenant, that the new, you know, the new covenant, like you said, came to uh, end, came to replace, came to, uh, what's the other word you used? Um, You said end, replace, and fulfill. Fulfill. Yeah, Mm -hmm. to fulfill, you know, the prophecies and all the things, you know, that are in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People tend to get hung up on feeling like there's a different God between the Old and the New Testament. Mm-hmm. Um, how would you answer that? Did God change from the Old to the New? How would you kind of reconcile that? Oh, yes. Yeah, <laughs> definitely change. <laughs> no. no, I think uh, I think it's a really fair question. And again, I think the question is probably asked because of what we talked about earlier and the confusion between the Old and the New Covenant. And that the Old Covenant had a time. The Old Covenant had a place. The Old Covenant had a people. The Old Covenant had a very specific purpose. And equally so, the New Covenant has a time. It has a context. It has a place. It has a very specific purpose for the entire world for everyone. And I think that's really important to understand the old context and the new context and the old covenant and the new covenant, that they have a time and a place. And as a result of the context, God will function. God is the same. God is still a God of love. God is still God of justice. But with the old covenant, it was conditional. With the old covenant, it was all based upon the behavior of the people. Like, hey, if you do this, I'm going to bless you. If you don't do this, I'm going to curse you or I'm going to allow the Babylonians to conquer you. Very conditional. The new covenant is very much based upon what Jesus Christ has done for us. So it's unconditional, based upon the work he has done, his substitutionary atonement, which means he stepped in in our place for our behavior. Now God, through our faith in Christ, sees us through Christ in spite of our behavior. 
So that doesn't mean our behavior doesn't matter. That's a whole discussion for a diff different day. I'm just explaining the basis and the foundation of the two covenants. Well, then when you tr if you don't know that and you look at the covenants or the old and the new at face value, you see how God's acting under this covenant and how God's acting under this covenant. It gets very, very confusing, and we think two different gods. It's the same God. It's a God of love. It's a God who's infinite. It's a God who's merciful. It's a God who is a God of justice. And so two different covenants, two different contexts, two different people, two different time frames. Same God. Same God. Yep. I think that's a good way to put it. Same God, two different contexts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a very probably sim probably simplified, but also really helpful. Super simplified. Helpful yeah. answer to, to that question. Uh, last question for part two. What are the implications of this in our personal life? There's a lot of intellectual things we can talk about, a lot of historical things, but um, the fact that Jesus replaced the old covenant, fulfilled it, ended it, um, and the new is established. What is the implication of that in our personal life? Obviously, salvation, you know, is one of those things, but mm -hmm. what else? Talk about that. Well, we don't have to go to the temple and the animals and church services <laughs> yeah. are far different. Yeah. You know, it's no longer about, you know, the goats and the lambs and all these kind of things and the pigeons and the doves. And well, you made a comment about like blood troughs, mm -hmm. like there's no troughs to catch the blood and carry. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We don't have those on our stage. I mean, it's, yeah, it's no longer that. So that's, I think from a practical perspective, I think the biggest thing for me is the idea that it's what Hebrews 12 talks about is the implication is fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith that Jesus can empathize with us, that Jesus lived life. Jesus was fully man, and he understood what we felt, and he is our great high priest. There is one mediator between now us and God, and that's the person of Jesus Christ, and that we should fix our eyes on nothing other than Jesus. And when Jesus says, as I said on Sunday, I am the way, the truth, and the life, every question you have about life, every question you have about truth, every question you have about what is the way, every every time that you feel exhausted, he says, come to me, all you are who, who are weary, and I will give you life. Every time you have a question about meaning and purpose, he says, I've come to give you life and life to the full. So it, everything is now 100% focused on Jesus Christ. Whatever the tension, whatever the question, whatever it may be, is to fix our eyes on Jesus. And that's the implication of the new covenant, which means nothing should compete with him. Nothing should be on par with him. And it also means it gives us a lot of grace and liberty to go like, hey, I don't know about the sacrificial system. I don't know. I don't know about genocide in the Old Testament. I, I, I don't know. But for me, I'm, I just know Jesus, and I just have fixed my eyes on him. And he is the author and perfecter of life, and he has set me free. The truth that he has given, it truly has set me free and given me meaning and purpose and significance in life. So that is a powerful implication to go, that's it. 100% Jesus, don't take your eyes off him. And so for me, I think that clears up a lot of confusion. And for you and for those watching and listening, my hope is it clears up a lot of confusion as well. Yeah. And I'll just add on there, Second Corinthians 5.17 uh, says that any that means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life has gone, a new life has begun. Mm -hmm. And it's that old has gone, new is here. Mm -hmm. um, new identity, washed white as snow. You know, there, there's, a, there's a whole lot to unpack there in terms of um, being made new in Christ uh, and the implications of that in our everyday life and walking with Jesus and what that means. But um, that is something that brings hope and joy and peace and, and value to our life and meaning. Mm -hmm. you know, in a lot of ways. Yeah, and it's also that whole idea, like, and we'll talk about this in part four a little bit, but our identity in Christ. It's like, we should rest in that. That is, that the new covenant introduces that it's not based upon what I have and have not done, because what I have and have not done is already paid for by what Jesus did on the cross for me. Mm -hmm. So when God sees me, he sees me through what Christ has done for me. And out of that, our hope and our desire is to respond out of that identity, out of that new creation, out of that worth, out of that love relationship with Christ. And when we don't, that's a lot of times we're functioning out of our own strength, right. our own flesh, and so on. But that's the new covenant, which is beautiful because, again, it's not conditional. It's like, man, I messed up last night. Well, God and I, I guess God doesn't love me now. You know, that's old covenant thinking. That's temple thinking. Well, I did really good last night. You know, I guess God's, like, happy with me now. 
No, you're forgiven, and you have a right standing with God. You're good with God because of what Jesus Christ has done for you and because of your confidence in him. And it's out of that that we choose to follow Jesus and what he commands. Yeah. And that, that it just, it's far simpler. It's a, certainly a higher standard. I mean, Jesus didn't come to lower the bar in terms of, you know, morality and choices. It's yep. a higher standard, but it's far simpler and far less complicated. Yep. Now, you did just mention Jesus' commands, and I want to end there because that's actually going to be part three, mm-hmm. uh, because when we kind of embrace the new covenant, we look back at all these Old Testament, Old Covenant commands, and we go, well, what do we do with these now? And Jesus actually answers that and what he talks about with his new command, uh, a command he gave to the disciples and he gives to us. And uh, we're going to be unpacking that in part three. So uh, if you're listening, if you're watching, uh, make sure to go back and listen to part two if you did not. And we will see you for part three this Sunday, either online or in person. Awesome. Thanks, Jeremy.